Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Kyle, and today I'm going to give you an introduction to practical declarative programming. So I'm going to go over what these concepts are and allow, how they allow us to write more readable and write understandable code. So to get started, let's look at imperative programming. That is a paradigm which is really common in Objective C. It's where you tell a machine, a computer, or an iPhone how to do something. As a result, what you want to happen will happen. Well, hopefully, maybe it won't. It's where you describe how to achieve something. And declarative programming is kind of the opposite of this. It's the opposite of imperative programming. It's where you tell a machine what you would like to happen. The machine should figure out how to do it. You describe what to do, not how to do it. Uh, so why would you use declarative programming? Well, let's take a quick look at what reasons you might have. It might differ between on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. It might, like, the code of the program might not apply to everything, but I think it's great. So it allows us to write code which exposes less implementation details. Uh, it's, the code of the program is much easier for developers who are not familiar with your code to read it and understand it. They don't need to understand all the implementation details because these are abstracted away from us. It's, the code of the program is often constraint driven which means there are constraints on how you can write code, which means there is less room for programming errors. General, general purpose APIs allow, may allow you to solve problems in multiple ways, and which might yet be issues of that. So this sounds great. How do we do this? Well, there are a couple of ways. The first one I'm going to go over is DSLs, or domain specific languages. These are like a specialized language. They're often built on top of other general purpose languages. Uh, they offer us uh, intuitive, specific language to solve a particular problem within a certain domain. So DSLs are built for constraints. They offer you very little freedom to do whatever you want. The language is built for a very specific domain, a very specific purpose, and first doesn't offer you the ability to do anything. You're forced to work in a specific way. There's usually only one way to solve a problem in a DSL. A good example of this is regular expressions or regex. This is a great DSL. It's Basically, a sequence of characters that define a search pattern. It's great for pattern matching with strings or find and replace like operations. Now, a regex pattern can look something like this. Here, we've declared a regex pattern for matching a day. In this case, we have a backslash D, which represents a digit in regex. So here, we have a regex pattern which matches two digits, forward slash, two digits, forward slash, four digits. So the day. This represents day, month, and year. So, for example, this pattern would match today's date. The regex pattern is not tied to any implementation details. We've, we didn't have to write any specific instructions to the computer. It figured out this from us telling it what we wanted to achieve. The regex pattern works across a variety of implementations. For example, in Swift, Java, Python, etc. And it works in a variety of architectures. It's not even limited to certain types of computers because it's not tied to implementation details. SQL is another example. Uh, SQL stands for Structured Query Language, so it's a general purpose declarative DSL for performing operations on databases. It offers us the ability to describe a query in, how, in a way that's not tied to a specific language. There are dozens of different servers and clients that use SQL. For example, MS SQL, Microsoft SQL, Postgres SQL, they're clearly different implementations, but they share a common language. SQL looks something like this. This is a simple query which uh, describes pulling all of the comments where the author's name is Kyle from our database. We haven't mentioned how to achieve this problem, how to solve it. It's very similar to NS Predicate in Objective-C. It's another DSL. I'm sure you've all heard of this one. It's common and it's a great way for filtering data regardless of implementation details. It's used to perform filters of ob NS objects in arrays or objects in core data which could be persisted by SQLite, which is SQL, so it's translated. A predicate can look something like this. We've described a filter. It's kind of hard to read there. But basically, it's similar to the filter for the uh, previous example, where we're just filtering for name equals Kyle. And when we perform this query on an array of NS objects, it will use key value coding to determine if the name is Kyle or not. If we use this against core data, it might be converted to SQL depending on our persistence store. NS predicate can be a bit cumbersome, especially when it comes to creating these predicates and sort of descriptors due to its lack of type safety. 
compiler doesn't check these string string like the typed arguments, which mean it may not work at runtime or load decompile. After Swift was announced last year, I immediately started working on a library called Query Kit. It's a Swift DSL specifically for core data, which offers type safe uh, querying for core data. So if we take a similar example to before, how would we perform a, a query for all of the people named Kyle order by name? So in Cordea, we're going to have to write a bunch of code, six or so lines. You need to create an NS fetch request to query the database. Using this API, you would have to write a lot of code to simply pull it out. You'd have to uh, create your predicate, your sort script to set them, and perform a query. It's quite repetitive. And considering this simple operation can be described in a single English sentence, this is quite complicated. And with Query Kit, this is much simpler. You instead create a, the same query with a single line, although I've wrapped it into three lines here just for the purpose of this screenshot. There is little room for runtime error here because these are compiled type types. So here we have person.name equals car, and it's not a single string. It instead returns a predicate that does the same query. You can see this is far more readable and easier to stand when looking at this code. Anyone can look here and understand what we're trying to do. It's quite obvious you're ordering something by the person's name, sending, and you're filtering by this simple rule. Query Kit figures out the implementation details behind the scene and executes them. So aside from DSLs, functional programming is another paradigm that promotes declarative programming. It's where we program with expressions. So what is it that makes programming, functional programming? What is it that makes a functional function functional? Well, when people talk about functional programming, they often mention a number of characteristics. They talk about first-class functions, immutable data, reducing, pipelining, recursion, recurring, minus. Let's just think about that. I think functional programming is, can be summed up by one thing, side effects, or the absence of it. It's where we don't rely on data outside of the current function. We don't change data that exists outside of the current function. So what is not a functional function? Let's take a look at some examples. Here we have a, a short example, which is a function called increment. What it does is it's going to increment the global variable by one. Now, this is mutating global state, therefore it has a side effect. When this function is called, it alters state elsewhere in the application. Another example could be this. It's where we're going to be, it's doing a similar thing, but instead of using a like, global variable, we're going to use a single thing. So we're going to use the default uh, center here, and then what it's going to do is it's going to increment some value in that, which is changing global state. This makes it really hard to test, since it has a side effect. Now, on contrast, a functional function might look something more like this. We have a single function called increment, which takes a value, does the operation which is incrementing it, and then returns that result. Here we've had no side effects. We haven't even used mutability. This is all immutable, and it relies on no global state. So functional program is made up of higher functions. And this name isn't quite uh, descriptive, so let's take a look at what it actually means. So higher function is a function that can take another function as an argument. Or it can also be a function that returns a function. <coughs> now, these two things are really great because they allow us to use functions which are highly reusable and customizable based on other functions. Now, in Swift, hired, uh, everything is a function, which is great when it comes to functional programming. By this, I mean a function, a closure, or an operator is a function in Swift. Now, this isn't quite the same in Objective-C. In Objective-C, it's quite different. Let's take a look at how you'd make something that's callable and call it. So by that, I mean a uh, function or a method. In Objective-C, you have classes, and those classes can have methods. This is an example of declaring a method. You first have a dash, or even a plus, which indicates an instance or class method. You then specify the result type. Then you have the method name and the signature, which includes all the arguments that this function may expect. And to call that, you would use square brackets. So here you have square bracket, the object, the method signature, and the arguments. In Objective C, we also declare uh, functions that may resemble. That should be a node, not there. Anyway, the biggest difference between functions is these are totally different. Now, which means that these can't usually be exchanged. You can't pass a method to a semantic sex of function and vice versa. In Objective C, we can also declare blocks using this syntax, which 
has a pretty repetitive syntax since we don't have type invariants. So here we've declared both the return type twice and the algorithm twice. It's kind of a night. I'm sure you're all familiar with this website that you can't really make out from there. <laughs> you might know it under a different name than the gosh darn block syntax, but there are lots of ways to declare blocks in JFC depending on how you do them, like if they're a property or a constant, etc. You can consume blocks in a very similar way to functions. But let's take a look at how it does in Swift. So it's totally different. We can sum up how a callable can be described in this simple little way. We can declare the input and the output, separated by a dash and a more than arrow. We've declared that this takes a string and it returns nothing. We can define a constant that's callable using this syntax. It's very similar to above. We have taken the definition from the previous slide and prefixed it with a variable name. And so you can set that to a block here or a closure just by adding a curly brace and name to the arguments. Now, function declarations are very, like, slightly different, but they can be described in the same way. This can be summed up to something that takes a string and returns nothing. Now, functions are called in the exact same way. You can just, functions and closures in Swift. You just use the name of it, brackets, passing the arguments. This brings us a lot of interchangeability, since functions and closures can be interchanged. For example, let's take a function called message1. It takes a string, and it prints hello, and then the given string. Similarly, we can define message2 variable, which again, does very, something very similar. It takes a string, this time we're going to print high and then the given value. Both of these types can be uh, described using this. They have the same signature. This allows us to interchange them. We can pass functions or closures to any other function where the signature is the same, unlike Objective-C where we'd have to pass a function or a method to a function that serves the block. We can completely interchange these types. Here's an example where we have these two functions. Well, one's a closure and one's a function. We can now call our message what we're doing here is we've set the message to variable from our closure into the function. Now when we call that message to, it's instead gonna, not going to call our closure, it's going to call the actual function. So when you call message to now, it will print hello 360 idea. Now we've got that way, let's look at some real world examples of imperative code and how we can use, how we can solve the same problem declaratively. My example is going to use this data structure. It's basically an array of arrays of strings. So it's an array of groups. First group has two people, second group has three people. Let's perform a few operations on this, this data set and see how we can do that. So how would we approach trying to determine how many people are in each group? Imperatively, we'd probably approach a problem like this. We're gonna create an immovable array, this called a count here, which is an array of integers. We're gonna then iterate over each group in our group, get the count of that, and then append it to our array. And then finally, we have a mutable array with the results. In the Swift standard library, there is a function called map. It's a function for transforming collection of data. For example, transforming our array of groups into an array of amount of people in those groups. This concept is not specific to Swift. It can be applied in many of languages. The declaration of map looks something like this. It's a function that takes two parameters, and it takes the source and a transform function. The source in this case is going to be an array of groups. Uh, this can be anything that conforms to the collection type protocol. And in Swift 2.0, this is a protocol extension, so the source argument will not be there. Instead, it will be a function on that collection type. Uh, the second parameter is to map is a transform function. You pass a function which transforms your data from one type to another. It, you can transform it however you want. So we can solve the same problem with this. So we're calling map, passing it a closure, which is going to take the count of that and return it. So in the response to this function call, we're going to get two and three in an array. Now, this is how you do it in Swift 2.0. However, in Swift 1.0, uh, count was a function and not a property due to protocol extensions which means we'd instead call it like this. But what is great, the count, uh, by the declaration of it, looks more like this. It's a function that takes a sequence 
and returns an integer. If you look back at our transform closure, uh, its definition is very similar. Transform takes an item, in this case, an array which conforms to the collection type. This function returns type t, which in our case would be an integer. So these are compatible function declarations in Swift Point, one point at least. So that means we can just pass map the count function directly. Instead of us having to write uh, imperative code on how we want to solve this problem, we've instead used declarative code to solve the problem in a simpler way, which is only a single line. Now let's take a look, look at another example. How would we order the number of people in each group? We want to move them from being ascending to descending. So instead of two and then three, we want to use three first. So we can get the first, like the largest group. Uh, in Swift, there's a sort function, which is a standard library function. It's a higher order function again for performing sort. Its uh, implementation actually adapts depending on how many items are in your collection type. <coughs> it's really performant because it adapts like this. The definition of sort looks like this. It takes a collection type and it takes a function called isOrderBefore, which determines the sort order. Is order before a uh, function looks like this. It takes two parameters, a left-hand side, right-hand side of the same type, and it determines if the left-hand side is greater than, or is order before the right-hand side, and returns a result boolean of that. Now, if we take our initial value, which is two and three, because our first group had two and our second group had three, we can uh, call sort passing it in the closure, which is going to do the sort using the more number prayer, and then we can get the largest group pretty easily. Now, in Swift, operators are functions, which is really great. So the more than operator is actually a function. It takes a left-hand side or right-hand side and returns a ball. This means we can simply pass that more than function directly to sort. Now, let's look at another problem. This time, we want to build a flat array of all the groups. So we want a, a single array of five groups, five people even. Now, imperatively, you'd probably come up with a solution like this. We're going to, again, have some kind of movable array, which is going to uh, contain strings. We're going to loop over our groups and append those people into our outer array, and then output of that we have an array of five people. Now, we can use a higher order function to solve this declaratively called reduce. The reduce function looks like this. It takes three parameters. It takes a sequence type, it takes an initial value of a generic type, and it takes a combined function. And finally, it's going to return a reduced result of the same type of our initial value. A combined function takes two parameters. The first parameter is the same type as our initial value. Uh, the second parameter is the same type of our source elements inside our sequence type. And the purpose of this function is to combine u and t together and return a new uh, representation of them called u in the u type. This may be compatible with a plus operator, providing that both the T and the U types are equivalent. It takes two items, adds them together, and returns a new one. So we can use reduce, providing it our groups and an empty array as our initial value. Passing it the combined function just being the plus operator, reduce is going to iterate over each item in our array. It's going to call the combined function on each item. First time, the uh, first argument or the left-hand side of the component function is going to be our initial value, aka the empty array. It's going to add that to each element, and the next time it's called the combine, the left-hand side of that will be the result of the previous operation. It takes the result of these and combines them together. And the output of this is our array. So again, we've took this our compared imperative solution into a single line it's really easy to read and grasp what the solution is. Uh, I have one last example. This time we're going to try passing a string representation of our groups. Perhaps some kind of structure sent to us by a server or user input, I don't know. Basically, it's a um, new line separated each group, and then each person in that group is separated by a comma. Uh, this is kind of imperative solution we'd use to pass that. Uh, we're going to create an immovable array, splitting out the components by the new line. Then we're going to componentize that by the comma and then append that to our groups array. 
And as a result, we pass the input string to the same data structure we had from the first example. I'm sure it's obvious that you can use map to simplify this a little bit. Uh, we use map instead of our mutable array for the iteration, so we've removed mutability. Uh, we may map over the new line separated strings to separate them by a comma. We could even great by simplify this logic even more if we have a comma separate function. A function we could simply pass into map. So here we define a function called comma separator, takes an input string, uh, returns an array of strings, which is that string separated by a comma. And then our solution is this one line at the end, which is input, component separated by a new line, map that with the comma separate function, which is a little bit more readable, but I don't think it's all the way there. Remember back earlier when I mentioned how functions, I mentioned that that included functions that returned other functions. What if we had a function that took a separator and returned a function performing the separation? Okay, we had a function called separate by, which took a separator, and the result of this function is a function that takes a string and returns an array of that same type. Here we've um, implemented this using an inner function, and we simply return that, and since the inner function has access to the separate in the same scope, it's gonna work. Um, we can use it as follows. We can call it to get a new line, and we can also call it to get a like, new line function and comma separate function like that. Swift actually has a shorthand syntax for doing this, for creating these types of functions. It's where you call, it's called currying. It's where you define a function with multiple sets of parameters. So here we have a bracket with separator, which is our first argument. And we have separate bracket brackets, which is our basically a function that's going to return. So it's pretty much the same as our previous example, but using the shorthand. Now our passing syntax is much simpler because we can do it in one line, just chaining these two operations together. We call line separator with our input and we call map with our comma separator. This is really readable. So why are map and reduce better? Well, they're often one-liners. We've taken our many line pieces of code, managed to replace them with a one-liner that both easy to understand and easy to follow. This is much more un understandable because we, we have immutability. We don't have things that change, like arrays that are mutated. Since the mutability is handled by uh, functions like map and reduce internally, it makes our code simpler. I'm sure many of you wonder what kind of performance trade-offs we might have right into character code like I've done in the previous examples. Let's take a look at that. I've pulled out uh, the first two examples so the declarative implementation and the imperative implementation of um, determining how many people are in each group. I created a small Swift script to execute both of these uh, imp imperative and declarative implementations one million times. And this performance script uses the optimization flags for Swift. Uh, you can see here it takes two seconds difference when you perform a million operations. So the declarative code is actually faster probably because the map function that Apple have written is more efficient than our simple loop. Uh, Apple standard library functions are often way more efficient, such as map, filter, sort, and reduce. So, don't need to write over arrays. Instead, use map, use reduce, write declaratively, not imperatively. Apple have given us a fresh slate with Swift to rethink how we use, write our code, a chance to explore these new declarative concepts. Uh, in conclusion, DSLs can be used to reduce bugs and build simpler generic declarative languages. And we've also seen how functional programming can be used to build declarative code. We've seen how building, writing declarative code helps simplify and improve the testability and help our code be more onboardable to new developers because they haven't got to understand the implementation details. Now, uh, all the slides along with the source code for that Example is available at my website, which is follow.li speaking. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>